It is there in the background. Um, if you need some support and assistance, um, we've told you in the past about the annual smile uh, bit that does contribute towards the benevolent fund as well. So I think we talk about it a lot as we do these opening slides. So I'm going to hand over to Julian now to talk about his presentation. So I'm just going to stop sharing and Julian will take over from there. You all right, Julian? You're on mute. Yeah, I'm fine. Here we go. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. Uh, just do a check. Can we all see my screen? Obviously, with silence, that's fine. We'll yeah. just continue. Yeah, we'll continue on on from from there, guys. Please excuse my voice. Uh, I've just woke up these last two days with an awful sore throat and a cold. So normally I don't speak in a deeper voice like this. <clears throat> but uh, you know what? It, it, it is one of those things. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm led to believe is um, that we're allowed to be ill rather than uh, other than just having a uh, COVID-19 there. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at regulation. So I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about compliance first. And then we're going to move on to the fun side of things. We're going to look at noise and we're going to see how uh, noise controls. And there's one or two practicals I'd, I'd like to do with us all there. OK, so when we're looking at. Um, there we go. When, when we're looking at uh, anything to do with noise, we actually have to go. There we go. There we go. Going to a bit of a technical issue there. We've got to look at the key documents from the the HSC webs website there. And, and what I've done is I've put those key documents together for you. So we've obviously got the noise at work. The one in detail is the control of noise at work regulations 2005, and that's the key one where we find all our information. But you can see there uh, we've got the other documents too. Take take a screenshot, and when you have time. Do do read through these because this ensures that compliance is uh, met. What I'd like to do though is I'd like to talk to you about uh, Regulation Five. Now I'm not going to read through this slide uh, as you all can read, but as uh, health and safety professionals, as uh, managing directors, anybody who's in charge of a workforce, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're done a full and detailed risk assessment of noise. And just to clarify this is that what we need to be looking at, if we believe that our uh, employees who work for us are actually <clears throat> exposed to noise uh, at or above the lower action value, which is 80 dBBA, then we have to put in a sufficient risk uh, assessment there. And obviously, it's not just about doing the risk assessment, it's about putting it into place. Now, part of that risk uh, assess, assessment there talks about the information we need to get. Now, I put this slide into place, it, it, it's in, and it's actually the Regulation 5 uh, is very clear of what we need to do to fulfill that risk assess, assessment there. So we have to include... Uh, sort of the level, type, and duration of exposure. Now, every different industry background has its own unique noise. So if you work in fabrication or construction to a, a certain point, what you'll find is your noise levels could be above at 95. If you're working with your grind, your grinders there or, or you're chiseling out wells, or it can be actually below 70 decibels when no work's being car carried out. Or if you're working on a food production line, you might just get a constant noise of 86. So by doing a risk assessment, we need to be looking at just exactly uh, uh, what the noise is and, and how it's uh, um, occurring too. So these are the uh, sort of noise technical data we need to be collecting there our A-weighted, our C-weighted noise levels, our peaks, and then also uh, our, our, our frequencies too. Because th these fre frequencies aren't just important for selecting your own hearing protection. These frequencies should be feeding into your health su uh, surveillance program too. So that's kind of a very quick bit about Regulation 5. 
like I said, I don't want to read through this all because we've got a lot more prat practical uh, activities I want to focus on there. But what I would like to do is I'd like to start off with, get, with the, being on my soapbox. What we're all accustomed to is bringing somebody in to do a noise survey with you there. And um, we have to get that noise survey right. Now, a, a noise survey shouldn't happen on an annual basis if nothing has, ch has uh, changed. But um, what we have to be careful of is that we capture the right sort of data too. And I'm gonna share a few do's and don'ts. And I'm gonna start with the don'ts first. Bear in mind, if you look at the HSC website, they talk about two thirds of noise surveys uh, don't, don't fulfill the criteria to do a successful risk uh, assessment there. And the first sort of, um, uh, I would say the, the, the first don't is like, we, we, I've seen it in noise surveys too, where we've seen static handheld meters and they use just those sort of two minute, five minute um, sort of snapshots of, of time and noise to work out your time weighted average there. And really your static handheld meter is there to look at your peak noise. And it's also, also there to look at your frequency band, band in two for those peak, peak noise. So by just sticking a sort of static handheld meter in, uh, in next door to somebody for three minutes, isn't given a true reflect uh, reflection there, and this is this is what we this is what we see from time to time. We're, we're we are an occupational health company there, and um, we are we always ask to see their people's noise sur sur uh, surveys they've done they've done in the past, and this that actually should feed like I said feed into your health survey surveillance, <clears throat> so we can actually check to see uh, you know, the certain frequencies there. And we see a lot of just people making an eight hour time age. So some, some should by sticking a static meter in, 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 in the air. And then what we see is we, we, we uh, question people. And we say, well, obviously you put personal dose meters on. How come you haven't got a frequency range attached to that? And they'll say, oh, our personal dose meters don't do that. Well, they do. In actual fact, the noise equipment out to the market today is that advanced that anything you need, your octave, your first or your, your third octave banding, your frequency range can be done on these personal dose meters there. And then we often see um, only A-weighted daily uh, data are available on these rip, uh, reports. And so... Um, by only producing a weighted uh, noise data there, we're not actually fulfilling the criteria in the noise at work regs, and it comes back to compliance. So um, we have to produce the C weighted uh, 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 too. So we see that's on a great deal. And then we see this too. Uh, we see a lot of low numbers of, of dosimeters. So if you bring somebody on site and they don't have enough dosimeters to cover people, um, we tend to find lots of short one hour readings going on or, or, or one and a half hour readings so they could cover. Now, the equipment's not cheap, but if you engage with somebody to do your noise, uh, your noise survey for you there, what you need to be doing is to actually uh, ensuring that the, the guys carrying this out have enough equipment for you to get enough data for you guys to base your risk uh, assessment on. Because at the end of the day, you are responsible for this um, risk assessment there. And finally, um, how many times do you see in your reports pages and pages of copied legislation and the actual noise content is pushed right to the back? And I think there's an element of like we pay an X amount of money there. There's an element you want that I think people feel that you should be getting something for this uh, money. And so what they do is they'll put all the legislation and they'll tell you what the noise at work, the noise at work regs are saying. But to be fair, you already know this. And actually what we should be in a report is this. It should be the full noise data expectations. We should have a noise floor plan map. And this is what's often missed out. This is what we're going to focus our, our talk on, is the control measures and recommendations. And also the hearing protect, protect, uh, protection too. Because what, what we need to be looking at is if somebody's not 
if somebody's at, actually, if, if you're over or under protecting, you see, it's still not quite good. But we'll talk about that at, at, at the back end of the talk. But really what we find in a lot of these reports is that we're not getting the control measures and recommendations put, put, put into place. Okay, which leads us nicely on to how often should you review your uh, sort of uh, noise risk assessment there. And then, as always there, um, to, be, to be fair, your risk assessment should act, actually be um, uh, reviewed when there's been a change to the process or you've uh, picked up on your health surveillance too that you've got a, a few problems coming to uh, coming to the forefront too so anything which is causing change to your current practice of work we need to be looking at um uh, uh, uh redoing that uh, uh uh noise survey there now when it talks about if you look at the, the guidance within the regs the risk assessment they say should be re reviewed on a regular basis there now, what they do recommend is at least once every 24 months. Now, I, do, I, I think um, it, it should be an ongoing process, you know, every time you have a change to manufac fact, uh, the manufacturing process. We need to be really thinking about well, what impact is, having, is that having on my, employ my employees there? So, um, and then oh, obviously, so it requires another uh, situation. If that requires a, another uh, noise survey, that's absolutely fine. So ba basically, this sort of regulation five is what we need to do to make sure we are compliant, uh, but also something we need to be doing on a regular ba uh, basis there. Okay, so when we talk about the day data, I thought to just share some data with, with you all so you can just see what sort of the minimum ex expectation should, should be. Now, this was taken off a personal dosimeter. Obviously, you can see the person's in uh, the manufacturing process there. He's working inside a uh, cabin. He's sawing, he's drilling, he's, he's, he's using a nail gun. So you can see just, uh, uh, um, you can just see just a exact, exactly, it's quite a noisy uh, en environment. He needs to be working in there. But you can see here that we've got the correct data, we've got the uh, LA equivalent, we've got the LC, and we've got the LC LZ, LZ, peak. But also what we find is we can actually now print off the actual noise profile. This is done in seconds, you can get some done in minutes. Now this is actually quite good because um, you get to see, you, you can link the, the practice to actually the noise and it, and it gives you a fair idea too about the risk to that uh, um, uh, that employee and then finally right at the bo bottom there we've got the frequency right across the bottom there so you can actually use this as part as your rib your review too so this what this com com uh, company does is well, we'll come back onto site we're on site once uh, every six months because we've got a uh, an issue with uh, 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 sub substances in the air and, and, and what they ask us to do to support their risk assessment there is to put the personal dose meters on the um, on the guys work working there and um, and as they uh, put put it on um, that they work normal day we, we have a and then we have a meeting we get the noise data we print print it off in this format there and then we go back and we have an agenda meeting, which is looking at the risk to noise. Is it going up or is it going down? And uh, it, 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 this sort of practice works really quite well. So there's regulation five and, and we've touched on there. Now, what, what I want to focus with you guys on is the elimination of control of noise uh, to people with, within the workplace. Now, it actually specifically says we've got to eliminate noise at source or if it's not reasonably practical, get it to as low as we can. And this has always been a difficult area for us all to manage there. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to, I'd like to start with um, what noise is. So we're going to flick between live action now and the, and, the, uh, and the PowerPoint presentation there. So I want you to actually forget what you know about sound or noise. 
And I want you to think of noise as energy. I want you to think of it as a vibration. Okay, right. So, so, so if you think about it, we need a source of energy. This is a four and a half inch grind, grinder there. And as that actually works, it then goes through to, it goes through to the air and our ears receive it. We receive the vibration. It goes through to the ear uh, uh, canal there. And it's that vibration process which actually makes us hear and listen. So if you start thinking about noise and sound, start thinking about vibration, this helps us a great deal. So I'm going to stop share, sharing now. We're going to go back onto live action. Just bear with me while I have... Um, there we go. Let's go on to that one there. Great. Okay. So you can all see, see me now. What I am go going to do, I'm just going to ex 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 explain just how noise works. Because we can't see noise and we can't, but we can feel it. If you go and see somebody like take that in concert and stand next door to the speakers, you can feel your body vib vibrate. But on the whole, we, we don't get to see or feel noise. We can feel the vibration through our ears there. So, ba so basically, all noise is is, vib is vibration through the air. So you can see here, you can see the noise being pushed pushed through. And, that, and that's exactly what noise, what, noise, what noise is. Now, I've just managed to fill my office full of uh, smoke. Don't worry, I've got the fans on to, cl to clear it there. Well, I'll just do that one more time before I do this. So it is, in actual fact, just the noise. And it's this energy which we need to try and stop and, and stop. Go, go, we need to stop that energy and try to uh, eliminate that. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch that over there. I'm just going to talk about my office. Here's my answer. So to understand noise more, we're, we're going to use a very simple technique. We're going to, what we call is use a, a, uh, a ripple tank. So turn this off, it's all going to be scary then. So there, there, there we go. So what I've got here, just bear with me when I get my, with my camera across. There we go. Can we all see that then? So, I can't believe just how much smoke I managed to fill up my uh, office with. Right, guys, so what we've got here is a ripple tank, and it's just a, a normal frame. See if I can get, to get it down here. I apologize profusely for those who get car seat there. So you can see here, I've got this tank. It's got a small amount of water in there, guys. We've got, and I've got some light. So you're currently looking up at my ceiling there. Okay, so there we go. Okay, I'm going to keep very, very still. So how does noise work? Well, it all works on vi on vibrate on vibration, but it works if you look closely there. You can see just how noise ex expands. But if you look clo closely there. Right, so you can just see how it's going across these sides. Let me just move my torches down a bit more. There, 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 there we go. That's better. So you can see just just how how much those waves are going, and you can see it ref, ref, reflect back off the side. Great. So that's perfect. So we know this this is great. So what I'd like to do is to in in introduce you to Bob. Bob here, you can see Bob, it currently looks like a blob. But you can see how um, Bob, I've got this sort of massive amount of work going on. Could be a bit of fabrication. We're working a, a way there. You can see Bob's exposed. So one control and the measure we can actually physically do with Bob is we could put a physical barrier between Bob and the actual source of noise. So I'm going to stick that there. I'll just, I'll just point this one, one out. Let's get that down here. So we've got the barrier going across. I'll just move Bob back a bit there. 
so we can see it. That sort of fuzzy grey line here is the bad barrier. So when I'm, when, I'm do, when I'm doing this, we've got a great thing. So you can see the disruption, the noise, waves going through the air. And there's, and there's Bob. Bob's actually quite safe and is, and is protected from the actual noise. Where things tend to go wrong, though, is, is where we put a physical barrier in front, but we have a door. Now, if you look very closely, what, what just wait until the water settles down. So here's, here's, here's Bob. He's sat, he's, sat, he's sat there working away. A, a, a Here's my barrier across. You can see the barrier going across. And, and, and what I'm going to do is, is still, I'm, I'm going to put some energy down into the water. And I want you to look at, at this bit here too. Even though Bob's not working in the same compartment, but I've got this door. And I've got the door, but we haven't shut the door. So just with this sim sim simple gap, you can actually see where beforehand um, you can see the disrupt the disruption there. We can actually see the, the noise coming coming through. And that and that's poor Bob. And what and what and what we don't re realize too, if I've got a, a lot of the energy this side. And it gets condensed through this small hole. It actually amplifies the noise. And this is actually um, one of the issues we have um, when we have doors connect connecting people together, and we don't shut the door because it actually just amplifies the noise, and we can have hearing problems there. So that's per per perfect. Right, I'm just going to move my camera back. For those who get a bit travel sick, turn away now. I'm just going to ring up my team just to see if they can um, just bear with me. I'm going to put my cam camera back. They're going to turn the main lights on for me now. So I'm going to turn the main lights on, please. Cheers. Okay. So that's just a very brief. They're just going to turn the lights on now. So that's just a very brief sort of, uh, 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 I would say, a, a the theoretical look at uh, uh, noise. Great, the lights are back on, which is fine. But you can't put any barrier in the way. So what I'd like you to do is to in introduce you to my Elvis uh, alarm clock, right? And um, and we're going to have just we're going to have a quick look and a quick demonstration at um, using the right materials to actually stop the noise. So here we go. So I've got my El my El my Elvis clock on. It's actually quite an annoying noise, right? So what I want to do is put a physical barrier between myself and the Elvis clock. So I'm just going to tilt my camera down. Just bear with with me there. Okay. There 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 we go. So there's the L the L the L Elvis clock. So what I've got here is I've built a soundproof box, right? So obviously if I stick it there, it's gonna have no impact. So what we need to think about, I want to contain that noise because that's one of the best control measures you can do. If you can't take, if you can't take, uh, so if you can't eliminate the process or we can't take that, um, that sort of uh, process out for exposure to other people there, one of the things is that control measure about building a barrier. So what we tend to see is people say that's a good idea. I'm going to actually, we'll, we'll build a box around, around it. You tend to find this with uh, motors uh, uh, and everything else. So we'll build a box and it will sort the noise out. So I'm going to put Elvis clock onto his side. And then what I'm going to do now is put on this tub. It's quite thick. You know, we're talking a good one and a half inches there. So is it going to have any impact? Well, let's let's just have a look. So much so, no. In actual fact, it's dampened the noise, but what it hasn't done is stop the noise completely. And this is because this material we've used is the really wrong material to use to uh, sound uh, atten attenuate. And what it is is what we tend to find: people get this polystyrene block. And they'll, act, 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 they'll use this because I think it's quite thick. 
but it's actually less sound through because it's full of tiny holes. Right, well, I'm going to turn off Elvis there because that's going on too loud. So it's really important, those just close your eyes, you all feel a bit car sick there. So what, 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 what I need you to think about, though, so if you've come in across noise and you think you've got things like doors, keep your door shut, and um, if you've got, and you, know, you want to build a barrier or enclose something there, it's, there's a bit more science to it than, than actually uh, putting in um, polystyrene. You need some thicker, denser material too. There's lots of little things like green, uh, green glue. So let's just go and share, go back to sharing my screen and uh, we'll have a talk about a few things here. Um, let me go to share. Great, so I'll just go to this one here. We're gonna flip between the two. So we talked about that. Here's some, um, uh, here's uh, a few things you need to be mindful of. And this is what you can do when you walk around. I think the first one, if you look at picture one is, if you've got any casing which is rust, rusted or anything al al uh, along those lines, what you find is holes come, uh, can appear. And, and um, actually, they can actually, where it might be 80 decibels, having a small hole acts as an amplifier, can turn that into an 85 uh, uh, output, a uh, uh, DBA there. So when you're looking at your uh, sort of a case and you've got or walls, look for holes, because holes will uh, amplify the noise. Where possible, if you look at picture two, and um, you can see that they've got a, a lovely piece of kit there, um, but there's actually no screen. So it, it, it's great, or they don't shut the door, you know, it, it's great to have to, to have these, but that's just going to push the noise out. In actual fact, when you think back to what we did with the ripple tank, the noise waves or the energy was bouncing off the side. And this will happen with this uh, machinery in two. And then if you look at three, four and five, ob ob obviously pictures four and five, the shots I've taken out on to site. You've got one room where there's a fabrication and then the other rooms uh, where ha house in there because they refuse to shut the door, everybody's exposed to noise over 85 decibels there. So when they did eventually put a door in, they actually used polystyrene to soundproof it and it had no impact. So when you do start to put, you know, to close doors and to put doors in place, make sure we're using the right, um, uh, um, the right sort of sound attenuating equipment. So what we're gonna do now then, guys, is so we've, we've talked about that, is going to look at sort of the noise which comes from vibration. Now I've put the page numbers down, so obviously when you see the slides, you can go back, uh, back, uh, back to to this. So what I'd like to do is a bit of a, a more pra uh, practical with 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 you there, so we can just see just how much we can dampen down um, vibe noise from vibration. And bearing in mind the vibration is from the energy. So let me go to un, unshare, let me go up to here. Just bear with me, I'll have a bit of a ta technical issue there. Uh, trying to get out of it, Let's, there we go, and show, right, okay. I'm just going to the screen. So, for those feeling cast decay again, what I'm gonna get you to do, if you could uh, turn away while I just move my camera back down again. So I'm gonna look down at the desk. So what I've got here, is I've got a um, a massager, okay? I just maybe if I put that, just get that down so you can see the full desk, guys. Okay, there we go. Let's get that. That's better, better. There we go. We see that's it. So we've got this. Uh, so we've got my massager here, and also what I've got is my noise meter there, right? So I'm just gonna press play on my massager. It's got a quite hard hard stand. Right, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you just how noisy that vi that vi vibration got. So it sounds actually quite a, a loud thing. I'll just turn that down. My wife actually used this on me when I come back off the ski slopes. It sounds painful. It and trust and trust me, guys. It it is very painful when she uh, uh, a wise. So I'm just going to stick my noise meter, and that's regist registering about 86 decibels. Right. 
But what we tend to find is that these seven mach machines too, if I, was to, if I was to put this against the desk, we'll just see just how much that noise goes up. Wow, that was actually got, got that up to 103 de de uh, decibels there, which is really quite loud. And what we tend to find in industry is we're mounting civil machines or we've got any vibrating mach machines there. And what we're not doing is actually dampening down the noise. So let's just have a look. I've got a very uh, cheap piece of uh, si 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 silicon. And I'm going to stick it down up onto the top. And you can actually hear the difference there. I'm just looking at the noise meter. And that actually was coming in at 70 decibels. So if you, if you actually think about this, there is actually a lot of mileage in um, coming from, from this point to that point. So, let me just get my camera back, back, back up, up there. Actually, it was, it was vibrating my desk a great deal, but it actually not the uh, cam, cam, camera off. So, you know, so it's really actually worthwhile looking around, seeing how your machines are fixed to the floor. Have we got dampening in there between them? Have, have we raised them off the floor? And then also looking at your machine size. So if I'm looking at, at this here, if there's any flex in any sort of machine casing, what we tend to find is any flexibility. And if I go, if you go, I'll go a bit closer to the mic. You can hear that low vibe, that low vibration. So any energy from the machine behind that, the more you get, the more it's going to do. So by a very simple technique of reinforcing your machine side i'm just gonna what i'm gonna do is just put a bit of a gaffer tape and just reinforce the back the back side there so you can see here i just put a sort of wooden strip and i've gaffer, gaffer tape taped it there so so you can see there's absolutely no noise so if you look at your your machine casing and your panels to your machines Majority of them will have that sort of crisscross to give them a bit of reinforcing. But what you might want to do is have a look at them to see if you're running machines at full power and, they, and you still get, get to that vibration noise. It's just reinforce, reinforce, reinforcing it around the back. OK, so I'm going to go back and share my screen and um, bear with me. I'm going to do that and share. And we're going to go on to here. Right. OK, so very, that's a very, very quick demonstration, uh, demonstration there on how you can actually use dampening isolation. These are all in the actual noise at work regs and they all work. Well, you would expect the HSC to put them in there if they didn't work. So what I'd like to do now is, is, is look at is look at you with uh, compressed air. So this is a manufacturing process. And what they're doing here is they are making um, a, the soft foam arm for a car part. So we've got a moulds which go around and they fill it full of uh, isocyanate based foam. It then goes up the arm to cure on the right hand side of this blue shelf. And then what happens is it goes down once it's cured, it goes to the trimming machine, which is on the left hand side, this blue, sorry, this green machine. That's the seat where the operative sits. And then these are the actual parts they've trimmed out. So we were doing a uh, noise survey with, with these guys. So this is the noise. So if you look at the noise, the personal, this is using personal dosimeter there was 88. We've got quite a few peak exposures. So by the, the machine uh, here, you can see we've got a peak exposure, 135 LC peak. 
over here we've got a peak noise of 130. Now obviously this is coming from the airlines they use. Uh, a few peak noise exposures here of 88, 89 and 90 there. So for a, a so so for a very what we class as a low noise generated process, the actual results we're getting were really high. So let me just go through a few, a few of the control measures we put into place. Now, I've actually put the page numbers on this presentation. So if you're looking at thinking, oh, that's similar to, to us, you can go straight to that page there and you can find what, what you need to do. So the first thing we looked at, we, we wanted to work out where this peak noise was coming up, it's 135. And it turned out here is the exhaust you know, from the, it's all a pneumatic system they've got, it's an automatic feed. But it's here, and this actually, that you can see there, that was the exhaust for the full system there. And because there was no silencer on it, and it's a small hole, the amount of pressure which was being pushed through that small hole was giving us a peak of 135 uh, LC peak, which is really high. I mean, that's, if you're constantly uh, uh, ex exposed to that, on a daily on a daily basis you are going to cause short-term uh, hearing uh, damage there so the first thing we did with these guys is we got them to put on some uh, exhaust silences there now obviously the it depending on what make you've got or or, or, or sort of what sort of machine you've got they're going to differ but there's a few examples from the noise that the control at work uh, Rex. but also so we did that so that reduced the noise down greatly but we also noticed between the molds and the next mixture being put in, they used an airline to clean them down. So we played around with them a bit, see if they could wipe it down, but that stopped production there. And, um, and there's a bit of resistance to change. Um, however, because the clean molds, there was nothing being put into the air, we we're just like, well, we can actually work with you using your compressed air. So the first thing we did is we actually put on a, a low noise uh, air no nozzle on the gun, right? Because what you tend to find is, is you've got a normal gun. If it doesn't have a noise, uh, a, a, a low noise air nozzle on, you're going to get that high pitch. It's the principle on how a referee's whistle works. You're blowing a vast amount of air down through a small gap. It's hitting an a edge, and that's where you get your shrill noise. So that was fine and that worked. But what we also noticed to the airline was that was actually uh, 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 um, connected straight into the airline which ran the machine. Now that was running at 12 bars of pressure. And so when he was releasing that, he was getting something like eight bars of pressure to clean the molds, which was a really high. So the next stage we did, did with them, we, we put a regulator on so we could actually turn the actual air pressure down to 2.5. In actual fact, we reduced it to some, something like 2.3, and we kept it as low as we can. Now, we had to play around with this to find the right balance of air coming out to noise. And so that worked really well. And that's what you could do with looking at, too, because certain people will use airlines to clean down. As long as they're not cleaning themselves down, which is a huge no-no, but um, looking at reducing the, the, your bar pressure really significantly drops the noise. And then the next thing we had was this. Um, because they had one ray, 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 radio in, let me see if we can get it here. So we have the radio position on the left-hand side. He couldn't hear anything at all, so they used to turn this up. So this poor person sat here, by the uh, on the left hand side, trimming these off, was exposed to 90 uh, db, dBA just so he could hear the noise. Now we reduced the noise down by uh, sorting the exhaust out, reduced the noise down by the airline too. But what we what we did do is we actually put in another radio. Now and I always say that one of my greatest uh, I would say my my heart sick moments when I'm walking onto site is where you come in and you can feel the music pumping through your chest and you look up and you see these uh, home 
um, uh, nice, uh, these home audio, nice systems somebody brought in from home, which are meant for doing sort of raves and discos, but they're not meant to be in the workplace. So by the investment of 250 quid, uh, depending on the size of your building there, by having more radios, okay, and or by having a speaker system which you can feed around, really has a significant improvement. Now, what you have to be careful though is then your next argument is going to be, I like this radio station, somebody likes Capital One and somebody likes Classic FM there. That's something HR can deal with. But what you do need to do is buy yourself a tube of super glue. Because once you've established where your radios and what levels they are, you need to glue the volume down so it's all balanced too. And those measures there, if you cast your mind back, the personal monitoring we had there was uh, 88, so it was above the upper action level there. We actually reduced the whole noise levels down to below 80 dBA. Now, that's actually quite a huge drop, that. Um, we, as noise spe spe uh, specialists there, if we, if, if, we make, if we can reduce noises up to 3 dBA, we think that's actually quite a good achieve, achievement there. But to drop it down completely like this, this, this was quite good. But what you need to be doing now is going back to your workplace, and especially if you've got air exhaust and uh, air jets, is having a look. Can you reduce your bar pressure? Do I need my uh, ray, radios on so high? So that worked really quite well. And it's worthwhile sharing that with you too. Okay. So back to the regulations, guys. So we're going to look at regulation seven, and it talks about hearing protection. I mentioned first in regulation five, it didn't I, about, uh, or in our, and in your noise uh, server report, if you're over or under protected on your hearing protection, because sometimes you can't just reduce the noise. Uh, sometimes it's not feasible to put them in a control box, which is sound attenuated or other processes going on. Sometimes employers are going to have to be exposed to noise to do their job. You made every reasonable uh, attempt to reduce the noise, but um, uh, unfortunately, um, we can't reduce it down anymore. So um, what we need to be thinking about is making sure we've got the right hearing protection. If you look at the HSC guidance there, what they are saying to us is that we've got to um, make, sh make sure that any sound uh, uh, hearing protection we provide, we're dropping them between 75 and 80 decibels. We like to go between, if you look at the actual HSC uh, hearing protection calculator, their range is 70 to 80 deci decibels there. And what we're finding is, is that if you are overprotecting, so say we're exposing somebody to 85 decibels there, and then we're sticking in hearing protection, which is going to reduce it by 35, they're actually, that person's going to be working in isolation. And because they're working in isolation, this is going to lead to two things. This will lead to them, in the first instance, um, taking it out when somebody wants to talk to them. Now, we know that if you take your hearing protection out and it's noisy, that's causing your hearing damage there. And the second thing it leads to is they're not putting the hearing protection in correctly. Because if you put your hearing protection in correctly and uh, you are overprotecting, what they will do, and it's human nature to do this, is they will, in actual fact, pull it out so they can hear. So they'll make their own personal adjust, adjustments so they can hear too. So it's important that we actually make sure that the hearing protect, pr protection's fine. So I'm gonna stop this, I'm gonna end this, this, that show, and I'm gonna look at the HSC website. So just bear with me while I just switch screens. There we go, share this screen. So there are, here we go. There are three ways we can actually assess your hearing protection. Now this is from the HSC, and this is what we use in our noise reports. 
when we talk about what makes a good report, what makes a really good report is the fact that you've looked at the hearing protection on site, not just one, but all of the hearing protection on site, and you're checking to see if it's actually fit for purpose there. So there's three methods there, which is the SNR, okay? And the SNR method is the simplest. Um, what we tend to find with people is that um, they'll go for this one because it's the simplest one to use. So they'll just take the rating and then they'll, they'll just minus it from the actual noise and they think they're fine. To be fair, it's not the best method to use. It, it, it's okay if you've just got a, um, I would say, a, a very average spread of frequencies there. Um, but to be fair, I'd avoid that one. Okay, so the other next method is the HML which is where we're looking at the um, we're looking at the high, medium, low values there. We're looking at A and, a and C weighted. And then the, the, the one I always advise people to do is the octave band method. Now, all is, we'll, we'll go through each one very quickly there. So this is really quite simple. Basically, you, you'll put in your, uh, your noise, which is uh, your C weighting uh, for your hearing protection, say it's 35. Here's the workplace exposure of 90. So therefore, it's protected here at 59. Apply the real world job. So this actually hearing protection, protection is overprotected. And it gives you a very clear sort of rating there. Um, what we tend to find is a lot, a lot of uh, uh, um, people who don't fully understand how noise works will use this. And they'll, they always, what they like to feel is, yeah, I need to protect them from the noise. So I'll go for the best one out there which obviously, as we discussed before, leads to uh, other ways. And then when we're looking at uh, this one here, so we're going to look at this one. I've, I've actually got some 3M hearing protection with me. That sounded a bit like a plug, but it's not. It's the first one I pulled out from my drawer. So, you know, you can actually start to put in some figures there. So I'll just put my figures in. So you can put your figures in across there, and it'll give you a rating. This one, if you've got an opportunity to do, guys, this is what we need to do. But I dear, dearly, I'd like to push you all to this one. This is, to me, is the is, is going to get you the best hearing protect, protection too. Now, there's two ways you can do this. It looks very complicated. It's actually not. Uh, you just put it in your, your uh, data from your hearing protection across these first, uh, uh, this first ones here. And then you put it in your noise frequency data there. And it's going to give you a nice chart. Now, every hearing protection will, will protect your frequency diff, diff, uh, differently. So if you're perhaps working in a CNC machining shop and you're doing high strength in steel and it's got a, a, a very high feed rate, you're going to get a higher frequency. Your noise uh, 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 risk assessment will, high, will high, highlight That'll be 2,000, 4,000, 8,000 8, hertz there. But perhaps you're, say, working on a uh, sieving in, within a flower indus, industry there. You might be looking at between 500 hertz to 1,000 hertz. So what you can't do is just stick in a sort of a, third, a 35 uh, uh, S, S R rate, rate in there. We need to be pulling the data off to find the right one. So the best, there's two ways you can approach this. One is to actually um, contact these people directly, give them your uh, frequency range and say, can you find me my best hearing protection, please? And uh, the other one is to contact your very friendly local occupational hygienist there who should in actual fact work with you there. One of the advantages we have is the fact that because we um, see a lot of uh, Hearing protection, we do a lot of noise surveys there. We have a wealth of experience to draw from. Okay, so that's your hearing protect, protection then. Let me just go back and show you this final screen. And then we can go into one final practical, which is my favorite practical to do. Uh, let me just go up to here, guys. And this is the final slide. So obviously, Regulation 9 is your health surveillance. If you are above 85, it's law, right? If you've got somebody with a known hearing deficit, anybody exposed above 80 should have hearing surveillance, surveillance too. Please don't fall into the trap of um, uh, working with companies who say they can do four people 
in an hour. Here is survey, survey, surveillance there. It's not particularly good because this is what you've got to do. This is what the HSC lay out in the noise out work regs. So basically you've got to do a noise uh, a questionnaire with, with them, which is great. You can do that beforehand and they can fill it in. But that uh, occupational health technician or occupational health nurse still has, has to go through that because you'll be surprised with the number of pregnant men we come across because all they do is just tick yes, 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 yes. So when it comes to that question, are you pregnant? They'll tick yes, because they're not really reading the question there. But this is what you've got to do too. You've got to have an examination down the ear before we do the uh, uh, hearing test. We need to see if it's safe to do it. Then you've got to complete the test. Now, we use the standards from the British Audiometry, Audiometry Society there. And the reason why ours take 30 minutes is because we test for the 8,000. Now, the reason why we test for the 8,000 hertz there is because if you don't and somebody starts to get um, hearing loss at the 6,000, by not doing the 8,000, you can't work out if it's your old age because your hearing deteriorates or it's noise-induced hearing loss. And so it's important that you do the full scope, not just the sort of the what you class as the mid-range there. And then you've got to compare it to last year, feedback, and then you've got to train your employee. That's the purse. So when you're thinking about, well, I get four done in an hour, you need to go back and question these guys to make sure they're doing that because that's in the regulations and that's what we've got to abide by, guys. Um, by all means, send it through to them just to make sure they do it right. And then fin finally there, um, you've got to actually inform, instruct and, and train them too. Now, what it does say, do hands-on or visual toolbox talks to ensure the knowledge is embedded and you might be saying to me but well how on earth are, are we going to do that so i'm going to share one final um one fi final sort of practical giveaway <laughs> one final practical giveaway which is really good so i'm going to get my boxes back 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 out We've obviously doing these demonstrations, we've struggled a bit because obviously these are better doing it hand, hands on. So for us to explain why we wear hearing protect, protection is we, what, what we do is we've got this tough and we say this actually, this is your ear and we've got a hole cut through there, right? And so with them, and then we just use very simple plugs okay so we'll stick that up up onto there and you'll see the effect what we've got first of all we'll, we'll ins we will insert this plug which is a plug and if you think about it we'll talk about well look guys i put that here in that protection in if i don't put it in prop properly obviously noise is going to squirt out right but this this is why we lift the ear up and everything else so we'll put that down here but on this other plug, we've, we've actually cracked it. So you can just see how, how it's all cracked. So I'm going to put that into there. We're going to squeeze squeeze it in because this, this is this especially good with earmuffs. Because if you get any cracks in the earmuffs uh, around the uh, uh, soft plastic foam, that's going to let noise through. So just bear with me, everybody, while I bring this one down. So you can see there. So let's just get that info, info, in focus there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise my box up, and um, here we go. That's better. So you can see the ear plug. So that's my ear ear plug. I'm just going to add some water there. And this is a great demonstration because it gets the lads involved. So as we add the water there. We just, we just use a bit of food colouring. You can actually see. So we've got it go, going through. Here we go. Let's get my camera in. Let's get it in really, really close. Can you see that dripping? So you can see on the, bo the bottom there. So when we talk about installing your hearing protect, protection, and we're talking about checking it, making sure it's in properly, 
when the guys see this, they go, yeah, you're right. And it's something hands-on and visual for them to uh, to actually do. And you could, there, from, from this point, we'll talk about, well, how to keep them clean, what's the best ones. And then the final bit we do with the lads when we talk about this is we'll talk to them about um, pulling it out. If you pull it out, literally for 10 minutes, all you're going to do is get this noise, noise coming through noise coming coming through and we talk about damage too okay oh, oh, okay guys so that's just let me just get rid of that before i guess get everything spilt so i think i've just gone over there but i do get a bit excited when i start doing my practical activities there i can hear i can hear this going to my side there so that's just a very brief recap of, of where we need to be and um, obviously, um, if you've got any quest questions, I'm ha happy to feel, feel, feel them now. Julian, I think brilliant presentation, great live demos. Um, I'll hand over to Michelle really just to see if she wants to, um, any questions that are coming through in the chat box. Oh, that was fantastic. That was really good. You want to see all the comments? I know you've been, you've been on your presentation, Julian, but it is it's far better than death by powerpoint at least if you can if people can see it practically like you said it's real life isn't it it makes it makes it come alive a bit more so there was only a couple of things um somebody asked asked me a question on um that i think could have been directed to you basically on your views on people using earpods under the hearing protection that was one um right okay And I'm just trying to, and there's another question come through also. How would you go about carrying out a noise survey for work with the tools and working situations change daily? Um, so we carry out ground investigations so we're using different drilling rigs. Sorry, I'm just trying to scan down and read it. So Maria, do you want to, do you want to come in and unmute yourself? You can ask Julian direct. Please. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we carry out ground investigations, so we never do the same thing twice. We have um, different amounts of different types of kit on site. Yes. Um, and we could be working anywhere from an open field to a, a basement. Okay. So different um, potential for noise to either dissipate or from reflected. If it was possible to do a representative noise survey. Right. Well, I think um, if you look at the, I always start talk about compliance first. If you if you look at the regs, you obviously got to risk assess this, and uh, obviously if you're looking at the occurrence of the noise, uh, of the uh, sort of noise uh, 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 levels there. You've got to look at the daily process and also as a, a, week, a weekly process there. You, it, it's really difficult because it's as similar to that of a fabrication or working on a construction site. Because I know over an eight hour time weighted average there, you're going to be under 80 deci decibels because the time you use your tools in comparison to when they're not using their tools. So what you have to do is risk assess each, each tool. This is where, if you were to carry out a nice sur survey there, is uh, doing a personal uh, dose meter, we stick it on his shoulder, will give you, well, yeah, we know uh, for, for that day we've got our peaks and troughs. This is where you might have to carry out some, uh, some addit additional work where you're looking at each uh, specific task. So what we need to do is, for instance, what sort of tools would you use on, on site? Varies. Uh, we use diamond coring rigs, handheld breakers, um, handheld digging tools, and then we've got different types of drilling rig as well. And um, we have excavators on site. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, my experience of of drilling rigs is they're actually quite no noisy. So what you'll have to do is um 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 you'll 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 have to get your drilling rigs when it's on job and it's on on site is 
do your static noise reading because it's a peak noise or if it's or if you're drilling for the period of an hour or 30 minutes with it put a personal dose meter on and then do your stat static there De get your data if you remember that slide i showed which i had the uh, frequency maps on with your things across the top and your frequencies on the bottom bit there do do that for that now if obviously if that drilling rig then is going to be inside a base a basement there the noise is going to be a lot louder too so you need to actually start uh, over a period of time collating this different thing so there's two ways you can do that uh, negotiate with your local firm normally does your occupational hygiene saying can I have a fixed rate look i'm a yorkshire man, so i'm going to talk money ah, 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 aren't i there so i'm going to say to you as you say to me this is the job i want doing i'm you, you're not going to charge me a day a day rate but um, I want to collect this in, in information they go out and do it and come back. Or alternatively, you can actually hire the equipment from uh, people like Casella. That's this, the stuff I, I use there. But then link into your occupational hygiene is to act as your, com your competent per person there. Okay. Uh, we do, I do do that with some of my customers in a similar situation to you, but I've trained them. I said, well, this is how you calibrate it. This is what, or this is what I want you to do. You'll take a photograph so I can see it's been carried out well. And then the information just gets sent back and we have a look at it. We do that, what I call the, uh, the agenda noise, but you're going to have to just take lots of separate readings. So to the point where eventually or no new job will will be new because you can always, that's just my phone going off there. So that's... um. So you no know, new job will be a new job because you say, oh, we've got this job or well, that's similar to that job we did when we did the noise. But you're gonna have to risk assess that. What worries me though is your drilling side compared to using hand tools, you'll have to use different hearing protection because your drilling will need a higher protection than maybe your your hand your hand tools do. That's but if but that's if the uh, second part of the question. <laughs> Um, what do you think about um, active hearing protection? Because um, those, um, those are available nowadays, that people with the noise level outside and inside, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a great shotgun shoe, shoe to there, so I, I do plays and I, I use them myself. So, uh, yeah, I quite like it there, uh, the good. What we're finding with technology, it just keeps on increasing all the time. So I actually, because 3, 3M have brought out a new one, uh, haven't they? Um, I know they've been there for a while now, but they've got ones now which you've got sound attenuated, so you can have music going through where you can talk to each other too. I think what you need to do is just find out what noise levels your people are exposed to and then take the right option to control. Now, I always, and I always find when you make those, dis, those dis, you, you don't your risk assess, assessment there, this is what your control measure is because you're not really going to reduce this outsource. Um, well, if you do, you'd be, you'll make millions of pounds and I don't think we can. But um, then what you've got to do is put your control measures in place. So whatever control measures you put in place is great. I always say, put the word your honor on the end. So I say, I'm going to use these active here because it keeps it really low and everything else, your honor. And it just makes you think about, yeah, an actual fact. That I've actually risk assessed that well. Thank you very much. But if, I was going to say, if you want to talk for, further outside of the me the meeting there, please please do because um um it, it's um it it, it 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 can be quite a complicated task. Well, thank thanks so much. I hope that I hope that's uh, answered it for you, Maria. I've got another person who wants to ask a question. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Denise, if you want yep. to come up, if you want to ask your question, just that's it. Go for it. That's correct. Thank you. Um, so I just first I want to thank you, Julian, for the amazing presentation. Um, so my name is Denitza. I am third year BSc environmental health student. Um, I'm currently working as a WHS specialist. Um, and uh, an intern. Uh, so I have a project I'm working on. Um, it's regarding noise. So our noise survey done by an external company reveals that we have a mandatory noise zone. Um, so what we have 
what we have done is we delivered some uh, time on task monitoring sheets to to understand how how long these people spent in the in this area and whether as a temporary measure we can implement job rotation of course we're looking at engineering controls etc but as temporary measure so we have identified that um the daily exposure is above 80 85 decibels but the weekly exposure falls uh, falls below that it's about 82 decibels so my question is if we have a daily exposure of 86 decibels that means that we need to provide audiometric tests is that correct yes yes if you if you look at the regulations there it'll just turn around and say above 85 or i think it could be 87 or i'll have to i can you have to provide all all your metric tests tests in there uh, however we as an occupational health company we know if you're exposed to over 80 decibels we will um actually still recommend hearing uh or or all audiometry testing too just be, just because we don't know who's got a known hearing deficit. By the way, you lose, you start to damage your hearing at 76 decibels, right? So if you think about, we call it the iPod generation, the older members will call it the Walkman ge generation. Well, let's go back to the future there. The iPod ge ge generation, of those who have been wearing the uh, earphones directly into the hearing there. We we had uh, one of our companies there uh, brought in ten new uh, apprentices. They were between sixteen and seventeen and a half year years old. Six of those got a uh, category two. Okay, and then we had uh, one of them was a category one with a notch, which is that noise induced hear hearing loss. This is before the start of the work of manufact the world of manufacturing. There, this is because of the iPods. So, yes, the guidance will tell you eight, 85 on a daily basis, you need to do this because they're still going to be exposed to 85, even though over weekly, because it could be exposed Monday, 85 decibels. Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday could be 70 because they're not doing any work. But then Thursday, Friday, 85 decibels again, that's still going to damage their hearing. So this is why we have to do it. What you, what, what you will find difficult, though, if they're exposed to like 87 or uh, 86 decibels, is finding the right uh, hearing protection to bring it down between 70 and 80. I am currently okay. actually struggling with finding the right PPE because the, our noise report doesn't provide um, LCP readings uh, or any um, uh, frequencies um, yeah. at all. And the noise, uh, mon the noise level meter we have here as well, uh, it's unable to, to provide octave band analysis. So I currently struggle with um, identifying what uh, suitable hearing protection I can implement. So to who I need, I mean, what I need to do in this case, do I need to arrange? Um, well, but listen, to, to me, I mean, um, you've spent your money on a noise uh, survey there. And um, I've shared this, this, the slide on the screen from Regulation 5, which tells you what you need to go through there. What, what, initially, what you need to be doing is to go back to the people who've done your noise survey. And this is, I, I get really cross with people like this because, you know, it's not about making a quick buck at the end of the day. This is somebody's health. You know, and it's really important that we look after our work, our workforce. You need to be going back to them, sharing that bit under the regulation five in an email saying to them, can you provide me this day, this data, uh, which is actually what you should be doing. And then obviously, whatever you get back, um, the next stage is no, you need to come back and do a proper job uh, and make sure you, you do this right. What? by not producing the full frequency range, they are tying your hand behind your back a bit there because you actually, you can get hearing protection for 86 with a high frequency, which still bring you down to 70 to 80 there. Um, so that's what you need to do. Um, but also you need to risk assess this. So if the noisy one day, 
think about what tools they're using to, right? So think about what tools and what processes and uh, from that bit you can, and then try and talk to them throughout the week. Uh, uh, oh, okay. I mean, I have a sim similar sit situation. I was down in Lon London last week with a load of steel erectors there. Now they are a wonderful bunch. They kept me entertained for the full day with their stories of what they get up to, but they they're more than happy to pick up a grinder, grind away, and um, do do that on and off throughout the day. Get a hammer, hammer and knock things through, which is an impact noise or an impulse noise, which is just like having a gun fired off in your ear there, but refuse to wear any hearing protection. But then get really upset at the fact that their hair is going down. So spend that day with them and educate them. But we have to look at what jobs they were doing. So if you go back and look at what jobs your guys are doing, and you can associate a task and a tool. But yeah, do you know what I said that the HSC say two thirds of noise reports don't fulfil the criteria. I just think you're falling a bit um, um, victim to that there. And that's actually quite a valid point, guys. If you, I mean, I'm, I'll share the slides with you. But when you engage with any occupational hygienist to do your noise survey there, when you write and engage with them, you need to direct direct them to do that. And that's right, put that slide that slide in saying, this is the data I need for all the noise reasons you do. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're just time's getting a, running away with us a little bit now, Julian. We could listen Sorry, to you all day. It's really, very, really engaging. It's been really good. You've got really, really good um, comments on, on the chat. Everyone's really enjoyed the way that um, it's been more practical than in a deaf crowd PowerPoint. So we are going to share this. A few people have been asking. So the presentation, you don't mind yeah. sharing, do you, with us? It's what no, of course website. not. So I, I think there's one one final thing. Are you going to put your contact details on there? So if anyone wants to come to you directly, yeah, Julian? yeah, of course. I mean, it's my final slide. But I mean, it, we're always have to put it up on the final slide. But uh, yeah, obviously, guys, you need to contact us. You, you can. Miss Michelle, you you mentioned one question, which I think is quite important. And I know time's run, running away with this. You talked about personal uh, hearing in your your ears. There, look, guys. Um, the answer is no. Um, what, what, what we just, I mean, to be fair, even if they, your noise levels are under 80 decibels, um, can I say, say to you, don't have it within the workplace because you can't control that. And as, as I said to you, you damaged it 76. I was in a wood mill over uh, on, the, on the West Coast. And what some clever guys had done is they, they all had to wear earmuffs but they carved out so they could actually feed, feed it through. So they've got this, um, uh, um, and the reason why they wear hearing protection is so it cuts out the noise, but they have to turn it up so that's going to go straight into the eardrum. But if they put an, an, an earmuff on top, then you, you create an acoustic chamber, which is really going to damage this. So the answer is, guys, no. In actual fact, right into your policies and proceed, procedures. That is no, because you will have that. And if you stand, if you're standing up trying to demonstrate or prove that this is noise-induced hearing loss or iPod, yeah, you, you, you just can't do it. There's no way we 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 can do that, guys. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. I think you alluded to that before, didn't you, with the apprentice case? So we've got some new apprentices starting, so we'll certainly be checking that we've um, we've boxed that off in ours as well. But I think it is a common thing. I've seen it myself on sites. You will see people with. You know that they'll be in the world of their own, you know, brick lane or wherever, and they will have them in. And it's always a conversation that I would have on site if I spotted it, because if they can't hear, if they're, if they're being blocked out by music, what's to say they can't hear anything like, you know, if there's an emergency or a fire or something wrong? And um, in a in a workshop situation where I managed safety in a, in a workshop scenario some years ago, we found that the hearing protection because they were using all these noisy tools was that was that much they couldn't hear when the fire, you know, when we were testing the fire alarm. So what we had to do is put a strobe light in. So they knew yes. when it strobed that it was, you know, the time to evacuate or, or so that's there's yes. different things you can do to look at it. But just just on a time note, if, if anybody wants to contact Julian, um, the slides are all going to be on. Thank you so much, Julian. It's been really good. My pleasure.
and um, we're just going to go into some quick networking session. We've only got a few, well, we've got about 10, 10 minutes if anyone wants to stay on, but otherwise, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Julian. Take care, then. Thank you very much for that. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was a good presentation, that. That was brilliant. Better than I thought, actually. Yeah, um, the slides are going to be on the Merseyside IOSH um, micro sites. What happens is I'm going to close the recording now, and then they'll be shared. Because when we go into network and we don't record, so it's a safe place if anyone wants to ask any questions. So if the committee agree, I'm just going to hit the stop on the recording. Mm.